chapter 5. We're in a new chapter this morning. Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to dig in and get about four verses, all right? 
about four verses. I, pr I promise you we'll, we'll try to get through this as quick as we can, but I want to make sure you get what it's saying. Amen. And there's some things in here that if you just read it, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't read through Galatians in a minute. So when I read through that first few verses, I went, whoa, what did he say there? Took, caught me off guard. And I don't can't tell you how many times I've read it. But it caught me off guard. So it's best if it caught me off guard. I think we probably ought to talk about this this morning. Amen. And, and let's see what God is saying here in Galatians chapter 5. And again, he, we, I mean, it's no surprise that there's some, that there's some fishy stuff going on because there's, there's some fishy stuff going on. Because again, they've had people come into a church that Paul tried to establish in, in the country, uh, the area of Galatia. I won't say the country. I wasn't there. I don't know if they had a government or not. But I'm saying country, uh, the area of Galatia. Paul has established these churches. He's got people who said they got saved. Uh, they claim to be saved. Again, I don't know. You don't know I'm saved, and I don't know you're saved. But I know I'm saved, and you know you're saved if you're saved. But Paul would look at them, and, and there was a time there where he was saying, you know, I ain't even sure that people saved. It's like I'm going through labor with y'all all over again trying to get y'all saved. Something ain't right there. Something ain't right there. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say this in the beginning. In my weakest point in my Christian life, you couldn't talk me out of my salvation. In my lowest point, in my teenage years where I was living for the world and I was straying from God, you still couldn't have pigeonholed me and tried to talk me out of my salvation. You couldn't do it. I know, I would, like, like old Johnny Cash song says, I was there when it happened. So I guess I ought to know. Amen? Y'all know that one? That's a good one there. Amen? I don't care if Johnny Cash wrote it. That's a good one right there. But anyway, Galatians 5, 1 through 4. Let's get into the Bible and let's read and we'll back up here and we'll pray and then we'll, we'll get into the message this morning, all right? Chapter 5 of the book of Galatians, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd help me now, Lord, to communicate these things to your people. Lord, I know. I read it, other, I read it myself, and it took me aback for a minute. But Lord, I had to run through all the possibilities and all the, <coughs> the angles on what he said here. And, Lord, it was confusing at first. But Lord, I help, me, help, help me to help them to understand what you do mean and what you don't mean. And, Lord God, so we don't let the devil confuse us. Lord, may we, may we be settled and, and straight on this, Lord, that we might communicate the truth to other people. Help me now in these next few moments. Help your people open our understanding. Help those that are watching, listening in, speak to hearts this morning. Lord, help people to analyze and examine themselves, whether they be in the faith. Lord, there are people listening to us this morning that may come under the realization that they've never truly been saved. Lord God, I don't want to preach anybody lost that is saved. Lord, I pray this morning we really analyze what, what our faith is in. And we'll give you all the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Let me just start off by saying to you before we go any further, I am a firm, 100% rock-solid believer in eternal security. Amen. I don't believe that if you're saved, you can lose your salvation. Amen. Okay? I'll say that at the beginning. That might clear up a little bit of confusion after reading the text. But we need to examine what Paul is saying here because it's extremely important. And we need to know this for the sake of others who do not have a no-so salvation. All right? So let's... Uh, we're kind of in, a, in, a, in, the, in, the, in the summary of what Paul has been saying over the last four chapters. So he's, cut, he's brought it down to a conclusion. We're boiling this down. We're coming close to the end of the book. In chapter 6, he's going to kind of deal with a different angle. But let's look here. Chapter 5, verse 1... Again, beginning with what he's, uh, uh, he's, he's challenging these folks now. You, you've heard what I've said about the law and grace. 
Now are you going to walk in it? What are you going to do with what I told you? So he says there in verse 1, stand fast. What's that mean? I ain't going nowhere. You ain't moving me. I ain't budging. That's what stand fast means. Stand fast, therefore, where? Therefore, where? In the liberty. In the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. That's what we're to stand fast in. In the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. The fact is, my friends, Jesus has made us free. We are free. And God wants us to stand in that freedom, in the gospel of grace. He wants us to be 100% sure of that freedom and stand in it. Amen? In the gospel of grace. And again, I've said this before, but I'll say this again. If you go into the average Baptist church and you stand behind a pulpit and you say, Would y'all please, somebody in here, tell me where you find the gospel in the New Testament? Did you know that you'll have a whole bunch of different answers? But again, we know. Where's it at? Somebody tell me this morning. Come on, help me now. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's sad, y'all. If somebody asks you today, would you please tell me what the gospel is? You wouldn't have known where to turn. First, write that in your Bible. Write that in the, in the, in the liner inside the bill where it ain't scripture, but write that somewhere. The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Listen, listen, now I'm going to read it to you. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the gospel, not a gospel, but the gospel, which I preached unto you, which ye also, which also ye have received. I offered it, you took it, and wherein ye stand. So they stand in the gospel. They stand in the liberty. Amen. He says, by which also ye are saved. If. That's a big word. That two letter word right there. If. What does he say? If you what? If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. What in the world did that mean? He said, look here. I preached it to you, but it ain't my job to make sure you got what I said. It's my job to make sure I made it plain. But it's not my job to understand it for you. Amen? I can tell you, again, you can put out all kinds of water and horse feed. It's the job, horse's job to eat and drink. Amen? So Paul is saying to them, not, nothing more than this. I gave you the truth. It's up to you whether or not you received it or not. And you did if you remember what I told you. If you got saved, there's no denying you know what I told you. Right? But if you didn't get saved, there's a chance you go, uh, well, I think, uh, maybe, uh, you know, you don't know. But I'm going to tell y'all something. Look up here. I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on Jesus. But when I was seven years old, I got born again saved. Amen? I did not understand all there was to know about living the Christian life. And the devil, uh, he, he hijacked my, my Christian life and he led me down the wrong path. But I still knew I was saved. I knew that if I died, I was going to heaven. Even though I knew I wasn't pleasing God. Even though I knew I was backslid as the devil himself. Even though I knew that God was disappointed in me. I still knew that I didn't deserve it, but I had salvation. And I attribute that to a mama who took me to church and put me in Sunday school and a Christian school that she put me in in the fourth grade and I, and I grew up under the tutelage of people that cared about my soul. <clears throat> but he said, you're saved if you keep in memory what I preached on you unless you believed in vain. I'm going to tell you, there's some people who believe in vain. They, they just, you, and, and I'm going to tell you something else. It's sad too, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of preachers who practice one, two, three, repeat after me, witnessing. Y'all know what I mean by that? They'll go through a gospel message so fast and so muddy 
not clear, not making sure people understand what they're saying. I've seen it happen. I, I've, talked to you, I've talked to you about it before. I didn't intend to go into this this morning, but I think I will, just because it needs to be said in you. <clears throat> there was a time after I left Bible college that I, and I've told, I think I've told this, but I, I, the church down there, they, they, they like to come up and do a, what they call a afternoon Sunday school in, 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 a different, in a different building in some other city, and they'd go around and they'd hit all the projects and they'd round up all the kids that the parents didn't care where they went, and then they'd take them all to the church, and they'd run them through, they'd like run them through a mill, just, just, and it's something like this, all right? How many of y'all, how many of y'all want to go to heaven when you die? Okay, all right. Look here. You got to know you're a sinner. All right. You got to know Jesus died for your sins. You got to know He washed your sins away. All right. If you if you're ready to get saved, put a pray this prayer here after me. Now, how many of y'all think they got the gospel that quick? And then don't 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 don't. All right. We got this many saved today. I'm sorry. When I was when I was in that Bible college. When I was going through the process and going through the motions, I knew something was wrong. I felt it in my soul. This is, this is not what I signed up for. This is like vacuum cleaner salesman school. If I thought for one second that one of my children was took in a room and dealt with the way I saw them deal with people, I'd, I'd punch that guy out because that's mishandling people. Listen, when you tell somebody about Jesus, and again, this, this won't cost you no extra. This is free. This is extra. This ain't even the message. But when, I just feel compelled to say it. If you're in the position where you're going to talk to somebody about somebody's eternal soul and where they go for eternity, and you're, 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 you're saddled with the responsibility of sharing the, the sacrifice that Jesus made on Calvary, his death, his burial, his resurrection with them, don't get in a hurry. Don't try to rush through it. Take time with them as if that were your own child or grandchild. Be thorough. I don't care if it's, if it's some old man you've never met before and as gruff as can be. Take time with him like it was your little sweet grandchild. Take time with everybody you deal with about salvation and make sure they understand what they are doing. Make sure they understand their need. Make sure they understand the, the power of the sacrifice that was made for them. Now, I said all that to just get us going, all right? So, Paul said, He delivered unto them, first of all, which they also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He did everything exactly as that way God said it had to be done, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Again, that's the gospel of grace. That's God's riches at, at, at Christ's expense. And if we live in bondage to a legal relationship with God, it isn't because that's what God wants. That's not God's will. God is pleading with us to, to, to not try to do it in our strength, but to take His strength and to walk in that freedom and not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Christ has made us free. There's no need for us to be in a yoke of bondage. We don't make ourselves free. Christ does it. You can't make yourself free. Freedom is a gift. And it's a gift given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's given by Him and it's received by faith. When you and I, when we, when we struggle to try to free ourselves from that yoke, we just become more entangled in that yoke. We can't get out of it on our own. We can't. There's no way. God has to free us from it through Christ. And Paul also was emphatic about this term, the liberty. We have liberty. Again, we've been set free. Amen? We don't... God is our sovereign. Sin is to have dominion over us. We've been set free from that taskmaster. Everybody today is in pursuit of freedom. And their idea of freedom is this. It's doing whatever I want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's my life. i got freedom. I'll do what I want to do. And they just do whatever. They don't, do, they don't deny any desire they have. They just live however they want to live and do whatever they want to live. And, and that's, that's a kind of liberty, but it's a false liberty. Because it's not the liberty that God's talking about. The liberty that, that's our freedom, it's freedom from tyranny. 
It's freedom from having to earn, uh, from our, having to earn our own way to God. We we can't do it. Amen. God has given us freedom from sin, freedom from guilt, freedom from condemnation, freedom from the penalty and the power, and eventually freedom from even the presence of sin. God has given us all that freedom, 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 and it comes through Christ and what He did for us. So we have liberty. And then he tells us to, he tells them to, to stand fast. He told them to stand fast. You know what that means? Take some effort to stay in the place of liberty. He's telling them literally, don't go nowhere, stand fast. You've got to do that if you want to have liberty. Stand fast. Don't wander. Don't go on your own way. Don't go on your own road. Don't try, don't try it your own way. Stand where God told you to stand. Ephesians 6, 13 and 14. Paul says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of who? God. Ain't yours. It's His. God's the one who gives you liberty. God's the one that protects you. Amen. Take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. That means stay put. That means, hey, that, you're not charging in the battle. You're not retreating. You're just standing still. You're staying put. That you may be able to withstand when? When in the evil day, when evil comes against you, when it tries to destroy you, when it tries to lead you astray, when it tries to beat you down and, 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 and make a mess of you, God says, just stand. And he said, and having done all, stand. Stand. And he tells you how to stand. He says, stand therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth. And I ain't got time to go through all the armor. But that truth, that's the Word of God. It holds you together. It binds you. It, it, it supports you. Have your loins girt about with truth. Have it on the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. Listen, this, again, you've got to have armor in order to stand. Listen, because the devil's going to come at you. He's going to throw everything he can at you. You need, you need the helmet of salvation to protect you against all these thoughts that maybe I ain't saved. Well, maybe, maybe you fell from grace. Maybe this, maybe that. No. Listen, I know I'm saved. I know that I'm saved. God has told me that I'm saved because I believe on the sacrifice of his dear son. He's my Savior. I know I'm saved. My name's been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I have a place in heaven. I know these things. And so therefore I'm to stand in God's strength and not mine. Philippians 1.27 says, Only let your conversation be. That means that what's conversation? Again, it's not just talking to people. It means everything you do and how you conduct the business affairs of your life. How you act, how you, how, the, the way that you treat people, the way that you talk to people, uh, the way that you, the, your interactions with people, the way you live your life. Let it be as becometh the gospel of Christ. And what does that mean? That means in everything you do, consider how your life is going to reflect upon the gospel message, what you promote and claim to believe. Amen? They need to, they need to fit together. Amen? They don't need to be, this doesn't match this. Okay? It ought to match. Your life ought to reflect what you believe in your heart. As a man believeth in his heart, so is he. All right, he's telling you you need to stand. If you're Christ, if you are, you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, stand up for Jesus. That's the reason why that song's in our book. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. We're not to lay down. We're not to sit down. We're to stand. He says, "Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or be absent, I may hear of your affairs." Why? Because you're letting the Lord live through your life. I'll hear about it. Listen, you live for Jesus, people are going to hear about it. You live, you live for you, nobody cares. But you live for Jesus, it causes a ripple. You live for Jesus, there's resistance. You live for Jesus, somebody's going to know it. Amen? <clears throat> you know what I find? I find this is a very small world. I find that I run across people 
I, I, that I well, let me put it this way: people, preachers that I know from other parts of the country, I end up I end up running into people that know them that shouldn't know them. But how do I not? How do I? How do I come to know them? I hear about. I hear they hear about these people. Why? Because they're serving God. It's not that they're famous. It's not that they're celebrities. It's that they're great servants of God. So the word gets around. I think God has something to do with that. I think God promotes those who are serving Him and and, and doing His will. All right, he said that I may hear of your prayers, that you stand, what am I hearing? That you stand fast in one spirit. That's what he wanted to hear. He wanted to hear that about the church at Philippi, and he wanted to hear that about the church at Galatia too. He said, how? With one mind. That means that everybody's thinking alike. Not, not necessarily like robots, but everybody's got the same heart, the same vision, the same love, the same Savior. So we're all focused on doing the same thing. We have communion. We have fellowship. We have a cause. Amen? He says they're all striving for the faith of the gospel. So somebody who is legally made free in Jesus. Jesus Christ has made you free. You are washed of your sins. You can still live in bondage, though. Did you know that? You can still live in bondage as a believer. You can be, look here, you can be deceived into placing yourself, your own self, back into slavery. Did you know that? You can put your own self back into slavery. You can go back to thinking that somehow you're going to be good enough for God to give you his approval. People do that. I'll give you an example. Y'all know the name D.L. Moody. The great preacher D.L. Moody. He told a story. He quoted this, this old former slave woman from the South during the Civil War. This was right after the Civil War. She was a former slave. And again, I'm not mocking. I'm not making fun. I'm, not, I'm using her ebonics. I'm not using mine. This is what she said. I'm going to quote her. But she was a former slave. And she was not sure about her status as a free woman. And she asked this question. She said, now, is I free or been I, or been I not? When I go to my old master, he says I ain't free. And when I go to my own people, they say I is. And I don't know whether I'm free or not. Some people told me Abraham Lincoln signed a proclamation, but Master said he didn't. He didn't have any right to. So I can understand her position. She's got authority saying, her, some authorities in her life saying, you ain't free. And she's got others in her life saying, you are free. And again, she ain't never known nothing but bondage up to that point. So now, do I, do I walk in this freedom, which I have never had before? Do I, do I go ahead and accept it and live it? Or, or do I fall back into what I'm being told? There's a lot of Christians in the same shoes. Jesus has given us an emancipation proclamation. He set us free, amen? But the, but the old master that we all used to have, and we all used to have the same old master, amen, the, the devil, he tells us, he, he can tell people that they're still slaves, and still in a legal relationship with God. In other words, you still got to please Him. You still got to do right. If you don't do right, you ain't going to heaven. You got to please God. He can still trick you and deceive you into thinking that you got to work your way to God. And they live in bondage because their old master has deceived them. And then he speaks about the yoke of bondage. And that, that kind of reminds me of what Peter said in Acts 15.10 about those who want to bring the Gentiles back under the law. It says there, he says, Now therefore why tempt you God and to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So again, he's, 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 he's talking about that yoke of bondage. And, and I mean, the Jews... They weren't able to justify themselves before God by the law, so why would they put that heavy, burdensome yoke on the Gentiles if they themselves couldn't handle it? They couldn't live in it. You know, and there were Jewish leaders of that day, teachers of that day, that spoke about the law of Moses as, as a yoke, but they, they talked about it in a favorable light. Paul saw it as, he saw it as a yoke, but he saw it as a different kind of yoke. He saw it as a yoke of bondage, and, and, and it related to slavery, not to liberty. And the yoke of bondage doesn't do anything but entangle us. <clears throat> I mean, we can get in our trial all we want to and pull God's plow, but 
But the yoke of bondage is going to leave us tangled and restricted and frustrated. It ain't going to help us. It's not going to, it's not going to bring us to where we want to be with God. It's, it's only, uh, again, you can't please Him in your flesh. You can't do a thing to please God. The only way you please God is by obeying His commandments, by, by obeying His Son, by following His Son, and loving Him and trusting Him. It's not by following the law of the Old Testament. No, it's by, it's by walking in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's by walking in the light of His love and honoring Him and, and worshiping Him and serving Him. And in doing that, there is freedom. Again, he's, he's talking about He's, he's talking about liberty here. There, there's a... Jewish, Jewish teachers have counted up how many commandments there are in the law, law of Moses. Y'all know how many there are? 613 by that discount. Imagine trying to remember 613 things. I can't remember half the time where I put my car keys. I mean, if it wasn't for, I'd stop and pray, Lord, where do I put my car keys? Did y'all know you can do that? Did you know when you do that, you usually find them right after that because God knows right where they are? <laughs> but it's true. But again, 613 things i got to do just to remember that's a burden. And imagine trying to keep it. That's impossible for everybody but Jesus. And it's no wonder that, that Paul's referring to to, to subjecting yourself to the law as entered into slavery. All right, let's look at verse 2 and 3. Actually, 2 through 4. Let's go ahead and finish all that out. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You're falling from grace. That ought to cause somebody to have a shiver up down their spine. That right there is scary words. Okay, but let's look and see what it's saying. Because again, I believe in eternal security. He said, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. If you embrace the law as your rule of walking with God. I walk with God because I keep his law. Then you have to say bye to Jesus. As simple as that. You gotta let go of you gotta let go of your trust in Jesus. If you believe that you are going to get close to God by keeping his law, you don't need Jesus. <coughs> because then <coughs> he's no longer your righteousness. You're attempting to earn it yourself if you're doing it that way. So so for the Galatians, in the context we're talking about here, to, to, to receive circumcision, which is a ritual that testified by doing this, by doing this, the Gentile was saying, I'm now coming under the law. I'm getting circumcised to signify that I am aligning myself, I'm becoming a Jew, and I'm coming under the law. And for them to do that meant that they no longer trusted in Christ and his righteousness, but they trusted themselves instead. So Paul's saying, if you do that, Christ isn't going to profit you anything. Because you, can, you can't mix him in with that and expect it to work. The legalists that are among the Galatians there, they wanted them to think that they could, they could have both Jesus and this law relationship with God. Y'all can do both. It'll be fine. You know, you do it the way Paul says, but you also need to do it our way. We blend the two together. That don't work. Paul tells them this ain't no option here. You can't do it that way. The system of grace and the system of law are incompatible. They don't work together. And anybody that wants to have half of Christ loses the whole. He can't have half. You can't have a little bit. It's not like going down a buffet line. I'll take a little scoop of the law. I'll give it to Jesus too. No, it don't work like that. Remember what I quoted to you a couple weeks ago. Romans 11, 6. It's so valuable. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Again, if it's drinking water, then is it no more of cyanide. Otherwise, drinking water is no more drinking water. That makes sense? 
You got a glass of drinking water? I said, hey, I'm going to add just a little speck of cyanide to it. He said, well, that ain't drinking water no more. That's non-potable water now. We can't drink that. Ain't nobody. That ain't fit for nobody. That's exactly how the law becomes, uh, grace becomes when you add the law to it. Exactly. It nullifies it. And the second half of that verse says, but if it be of works, you're going to do it all? Then he said, no more grace. You don't need to involve Jesus in it. Otherwise, work is no more work. You either got to have one or the other. You can't have both. In circumcision, which again, this is all based on the beginning, it's all, that's the seal of the law. That's, that was the symbol that says, I am going to follow the law. Amen? What is the symbol that says, I'm going to follow Jesus for the Christian? That's what this baptistry is. You're identifying yourself with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in this baptistry. All right? That's after salvation. Again, if you had to do it to get saved, it's a work. But it's after you get saved, you're proclaiming to others, testifying that you got saved. Bapt uh, very much the same way, the, the, in the, if you're going to keep the law, circumcision is you saying, I am putting off, it's, it's the putting off of, of, of uh, well, it's the separating yourself unto God, is what it is. And, and it, was, it was a putting off of the flesh in, in a symbolic show of I am separating myself unto God. And again, that's essentially what baptism does too. But again, circumcision is relating to the law. <clears throat> and, a, and a man who willingly and deliberately undergoes circumcision, uh, he, he, he enters into an agreement, I'm going to fulfill the law. All right? He's bound to fulfill it now. He's entered into this and he can't, he can't say that he's saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's now entered into another method of justification. He's, he's separated himself from that. Said, I, didn't, I, I didn't want that. I, this, is, this, is what, this is really what I want. That's a tragic, tragic thing. Jesus dying on the cross, pouring out his blood, pouring out his life, pouring out his soul, the agony that he went through, the love that he had for us, and all that wasted on that person. All for nothing. Two men died with Jesus. One on one side was a thief, one on the other side was a thief. One of them put his trust in Jesus before he died, and he got eternal life. The other one trusted in himself, and he got eternal damnation. It profited him nothing. There was the Savior right next to him. He's right there hanging, bleeding and dying. Right there. And hey, it is plain as can be to the other guy that this is no ordinary man. It's plain to the other guy there's something different about him and he's got, he finds out enough to get saved right there. That other guy heard everything that was said. Yet he said, I, I, I'll be fine without him. I'll handle this. <coughs> Paul said, every man that's circumcised, he's a debtor. To do the whole law. So when a person, again, these people are being encouraged to do this. this was, again, this is, this is the whole point. These people are being encouraged to abandon the teaching that Paul gave them and latch on to this other idea, this, this Old Testament law. Latch on to this. This is the true way of salvation, they're telling them. Paul, good, he's reminding me of the Pentecostals. You know, them Baptists are good as far as they go. They just don't go far enough. I sat in the barbershop one day. I heard a Pentecostal preacher say that. I bit my tongue. I bit my tongue. I could. I had a whole bunch of Pentecostals in there. I didn't want to fight. <laughs> but I, I think about that every now and then. And again, I, that's, 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 that's what Paul's saying. I mean, or that's what the, that's what the, the uh, Judaizers are saying. You know, Paul, he's good as far as he goes. He just don't go far enough. I mean, they wanted these. They wanted the Galatians to uh, to, to think that they could. They could. Y'all, y'all go ahead. Y'all can observe. Y'all can observe the law, and, and, and without coming under the whole law, y'all just do some of it. They're lying to them by telling them that, but they're trying to convince them of that. But when we choose to walk by the law at all, we have to walk by the whole thing. You can't just take part of it. You got to take the whole thing. So no amount of obedience makes up for one act of disobedience when you're under the law. It's kind of like if you're pulled over for speed. I mean, you sit there and tell the cop, I'm a faithful husband. I don't ever cheat on my wife. I pay my taxes. You know, I'm a good person. I've obeyed the speed limit every other day. 
Except today. That ain't going to get you out of the ticket. You tell them how good you are, but that don't make no difference. God don't care how good you are. You broke the law. He's going to give you a ticket. Well, it don't make no difference how much good you've done. You violated, you violated grace by entering the end of the law. So it doesn't make any difference. You can't mix the two. <clears throat> now let me just clear this up real quick. Because I know how it is in America. Moms and dads have their little boys circumcised as soon as they're born. And I don't want anybody going to leave out of here or anybody watching this think I'm saying something I'm not saying. It doesn't mean, what I'm saying to you and reading to you this morning, doesn't mean that just because someone was circumcised that they're now under a legal relationship to do all the law. My, I was circumcised as a baby. I assume most of the men in here were. And pretty much if you grow up in America, that's the way it is. That's kind of the way we do. But that's not what this is referring to. He, he's... He's, he, he's, not, he's not saying that we're, we are uh, under the law because of that. He's, he's talking about these people who are adults and they're, they're drawn to circumcision as adults and they go through this process as evidence that they have come under the law of Moses. That's the only reason they would willingly do this is to have that status and say we're now following the law of Moses. And again, you get people like that who try to live on their own righteousness, they get real braggy about their spirituality. We're doing this, and we do that, and that, and we do this, 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 and this. Uh, and, you know, and again, they, wanted to, they probably wanted to puff up about it and brag on, yeah, we got circumcised, and we, we're doing things the Jewish way now. You know, we want to be like Jesus. We're going to be, like, we're going to be Jewish now. But, and, and they, they kind of, I guess they kind of told them it was like a first step to getting saved, you know. And, uh, but, you know, Paul didn't really care about, uh, about, about circumcision. It wasn't something that was really a big thing on his radar. Uh, you know, in verse 6, right, right down here, I'll read it to you ahead of time. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So whether you're circumcised or not is really irrelevant. It's not about whether you somebody circumcised you as a baby or not. It's about if you decide, hey, I'm going to get under the law of Moses. It was a willful decision. Okay? And he detests this theology that's being pushed by these legalists. Now we get to this, this term, this troubling term. He said, you're fallen from grace. You're fallen from grace. When we embrace the law as our rule of walking with God, we depart from Jesus. We don't, we don't have any need for Jesus at that point. And there's no need for grace at that point. We're then estranged from Christ, separated from Him, and separated from His saving grace. <clears throat> Falling from grace is evidently real, or it wouldn't be in the Bible, but I believe it's totally misunderstood. Because here's why, let me make this clear to you. Most people, when they read the term falling away, they think, oh, that person... They went out and become a bad sinner. And they've wandered from God and ran away from God. And, and, and they've thrown their life away. It's not somebody who's a Christian suddenly has become an adulterer. Somebody who's a Christian suddenly has become an alcoholic. Somebody who's a Christian has suddenly become a drug addict. It, it, it's, not, it's not, oh, they fell away. No, that's not what we're talking about. You can't lose your salvation by immoral conduct. Just the same way you can't get saved by living morally. Okay? The worst you act ain't going to take your salvation away. That's not, that's not a license to go and live like a hellion either. I mean, because there are consequences to our sin. If we live that way, you're going to reap what you sow, and we'll see that in the next chapter. But we can't save ourselves, and we can't keep ourselves saved. But we are saved by our faith in Christ. We're saved by the grace of God through our faith in Christ. Again, I take you back to 1 Corinthians 15. By which ye are saved if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you unless ye have believed in vain. Again, if you didn't really understand what I'm saying to you and you didn't really get it, listen, you may not be saved. 
Again, let me let me turn to let me turn to Ephesians two eight and nine. What does it say? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is not by works. So again, can somebody fall from grace? They they can fall from grace, but not through grossly immoral conduct. Not by sin, not by them simply sinning. They do so by adding works to the law, the works of the law to grace. That's how. By doing so, by saying, I, I, don't, I know Jesus died for me, and I know he paid my sin debt. I know that's what it says, and I know that's what you preached to me, and I know that's what you told me, but I just feel like I need to, I need to follow the law because that's, what, that's how I'm going to please God. And that's how I'm going to get closer to God, is by honoring Him, by keeping all this law. And, and when, you, when you begin to do that, you turn away from Christ. You throw Him in the trash. You spit in His face. You said, I don't want you. I don't need you. You're not necessary for my salvation. That's as plain as I can make it. You are simply saying, you are not necessary for me to go to heaven. I can get there by doing it myself. You're spitting in the face of Jesus and nullifying the saving power of the blood over your soul. You could have had salvation in Christ alone, but you tried to add your good life to it. You tried to add your baptism to it. You tried to add your church membership to it. You tried to add your tongues experience to it. And in doing so, you nullify the blood of Jesus again. Anybody who believes in Campbellite theology, and if you know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about Church of Christ, they believe that you're saved by trusting Christ, getting saved in a Church of Christ, and getting baptized by a Church of Christ preacher. That's a whole package. They believe that's a whole package. Salvation is through that whole package. If that, if that person would have stopped right there at believing on Jesus Christ, they could have salvation. But when you add that baptism to it, you nullify what Jesus did. When the, when the Pentecostal says, trust and believe on Jesus Christ, and the person says, I believe and I'll trust on him, but then they say, but you've got to speak in tongues to give evidence that you got saved. And they, and they believe that they've got to do that too. They have nullified Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? It's not that somebody comes to Christ and says, I'm saved, I know I'm saved. Oh, I think I'll go get that and add that to it. I don't believe that. I don't believe for one second, look here, that anybody who truly grasps what Christ has done for them who truly believes on his sacrifice, who knows the redeeming power of his blood, would ever look at the law and say, I need that too. Even as a child, my friend, and I think you can probably attest to what I'm saying, even when I was younger, when I didn't understand as much as I understand now, if you had tried to add anything or handed me anything and said, hey, you need this, add this, I'd say, no, I don't need that, i got Jesus. Amen. Is that you? Would you have agreed with that statement your whole Christian life? Listen, I am in Him. He's in me. I know that. There's nothing can change that. <clears throat> you know, again, the truth is, I, I, I can't make, you can't, you can't make a true believer accept anything. Nobody can make a true believer accept anything except for the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I preaching up here today that somebody can lose their salvation? No. What I'm here to tell you is somebody can be told that they need to believe on Christ and then and, and then as and I'm not saying that they ever truly fully believed on him. Because if they ever truly fully believed on him, they wouldn't have accepted something else. Amen. If I am if I have got my faith in Him as my eternal Savior, I don't need no other. There's no other need. It's done. It's finished, as He said. There's no more room for anything else. If it's completed, it's completed. Evidently, for some of these Galatians, it wasn't settled. And when they saw there could be something else more maybe fantastical in their mind, 
something that they had to pay attention to day after day and, 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 and gross their life in making sure that they did everything just right, that looked more appealing to them. But what did it bring to them? It brought eternal death. I, I'll stand with the writer of Rock of Ages who said, In my hand, no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Let me tell you, if I stood in heaven five minutes from now, I drop dead behind this pulpit and I stand in heaven and, and, and God says, why should I let you in? Of course, that ain't going to happen that way. But if it happened that way, I wouldn't talk about my life. I wouldn't mention my baptism. I wouldn't talk about no experiences I've had in church. It's only Jesus. Jesus is the only way. Amen? Let me, let me close with this. I'm going to give you the ABCs of this real quick. The law accused us of sin. God's grace answered our sin. The law bound us, but God's grace bestowed us. The law condemned us, but God's grace cured us. The law brought death. God's grace brought deliverance. The law evicted us from God. God's grace elevated us to God. The law framed us, but God's grace freed us. The law, the law revealed the gap that existed between us and God, but God's grace revealed the gift that was given to us. The law made hell very real. God's grace made heaven very sure. The law made going to getting to God impossible. God's grace provided a manual. The law uh, brought judgment. God's grace brought justification. The law killed. God's grace gave us a kinsman redeemer. The law gave us the letter of the law. God's grace brought us the letter of love. The law gave us methods. The God's grace brought us the Messiah. The law never saved. The God's grace never fails. The law obligates us. God's grace opened the door for us. The law put us in the past tense. God's grace puts us in the perfect tense. The law gave us quaking and fear. God's grace quells our fear. The law restricts us. God's grace releases us. Uh, God's, uh, God's law, the, the law was on stone tablets. God's grace is written on a sanctified heart. The law brought the terror of God. Well, the grace brought the tenderness of God. The law brought universal sin. God's grace brought unmerited favor. The law brought vanity of vanities. God's grace, victory of victories. The law, we were washed by sacrifices, but God's grace, we were washed by the Savior. The law gave us extravagant laws. God's grace gave us extravagant love. The law was the way of yesterday, but God's grace is yes and amen. The law made them, made them zealous for rituals, but God's grace makes us zealous for God Himself. Amen? I'll I take grace, 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 and more grace. Amen? I thank God. I, and, I, and I want to close with this thought. I don't know that any of you in here are, are affected by this, but you know what? There may be somebody out there listening in. There may be somebody this morning, and maybe they're trying to make themselves to God by trying to do it their way. I don't know. I hope nobody in here is in that shape. But I tell you what, if that was me this morning, I'd come running to the Lord Jesus. I'd come running to the cross of Calvary, and I'd put myself under that grace. There ain't no way I'd keep trying to live my life trying to please God in my flesh. I, I, don't want to live, I, I wouldn't want to live my, my rest of my life in fear that I might miss heaven. I want to make sure it's secure. Amen? Mine's secure. I, I know there's security. In Christ, I know the blood's been applied. I know my sins are gone, but it didn't have. It didn't come through me. It only came through Christ. My friends, I hope this morning you got it settled, and it ain't no doubt in your mind. Let's stand together. And if and let me just say, if you if you have it settled in your mind, and there ain't no doubt in your mind whatsoever. You say, I preach, so there's no way you can ever cast any doubt in my mind upon my salvation because I know, I, I remember it clearly, trusting and believing on Christ. Okay? Well, maybe there's people in your life who aren't so sure. 
Maybe there's people that you know who are not as confident in these things. And if that's the case, take what we've talked about today and go to them and talk to them and share with them that there is no other way but Christ. That anything we add to it only messes it up. We simply must believe on what he did and what he did alone. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just ask you to bless the invitation now. Lord, I pray, Father, that you please would, would Lord, guide folks to make decisions for you. And, Lord God, I pray, Father, if, if anybody on the sound of my voice this morning that, that needs to come to this altar and pray, Lord, I pray that they do just that. Father, I pray, Lord, anybody listening in this morning, Lord, if they're not saved, Lord, that they come and, and uh, come to you. And Lord, that they cry out to Jesus and believe on the shed blood that was, that was shed for their sins. Believe that he died and was buried and rose from the grave the third day, just like the scriptures say so, and be everlasting saved. Lord God, please, I plead with you, do a work now this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 155. 155. We're going to sing this morning. Somebody that knows the truth is going to stay with the truth. Amen. Truth will set you free. So I just, I just, I pray for anybody out there this morning who's struggling. And uh, and you pray for them too. Pray for God to work in their life. Again, all, a lot of us got people in our life, in our circle of friends, that maybe they believe some other way. And, and we're burdened about it, but don't really know what to do. But we need to take this message and share it with them because it's, it's going to come a day when it's too late. And it won't be another chance. Amen.